Welcome to Mineral Wealth. Today, we're so lucky to have Brendan Urich. He is the CEO of a company called Electric Royalties. And welcome to Mineral Wealth. Brendan, let's dive right in. Tell people when you go on a road show, sort of your value proposition and how the royalty model is different than a traditional mining equity play. Yeah. So thanks for having me on, John. Um, yeah. You know, so your traditional uh, miner that you can invest in uh, typically has one asset. Um, you know, they own that asset through the expiration. They have to spend, you know, up to 50 million or more uh, to put together feasibility studies, you know, and move that project along to the point where, you know, you're at a construction ready, you know, decision. That process can be, you know, 10, 15 years. Like I said, it's highly capital intensive. Um, you know, and it's pretty risky. So uh, that's that's kind of the traditional, you know, investment proposition in mining. Single asset, you know, mining company develops their project, you know, over a long period of time. Um, royalties is a different, you know, way to play the space. Uh, I, I personally love the model. I think it's the best business model we've come up with to date in mining. Um, you know, we've got 22 assets. Uh, so we are definitely diversified. No one of those royalties makes up more than, I would say, 10% of our valuation. Um, you know, as a royalty company, we don't actually have to put up any capital to develop these things, to do feasibility studies. Uh, we don't have to put any money in for the construction costs, you know, which can be hundreds of millions, you know, up to a billion dollars or more. Um, and so obviously that's a lot of dilution that we are protected from. You know, royalty is essentially a right to the cash flow from these mines. Um, you know, when they're in production, they owe us a percentage of that cash flow, you know, anywhere from half a percent up to, you know, two and a half percent. Uh, we have no operating costs on that. So it's just revenue back to us. Um, and like I said, we don't have to put up any more capital to get to that point. Uh, and diversification, right? 22 assets. Um, and so it's all, it's a whole different model, you know, quite frankly. Um, you know, we're also focused on the clean energy metal space, uh, which is, you know, a space I think is really interesting. Um, you know, definitely from a supply side. Uh, but obviously from the demand side, which, you know, more people are, are up to date with. Um, but I think it's the supply side, quite frankly, that gets us the most excited. Well, let's talk about that. I, we're excited about that transition too. And we have some slides that'll take just a second to show. So this is what it looks like today in terms of sort of dependency on the internal combustion engine. And we were thinking about like, there's been a 40% increase in the price of diesel since May. And all the goods we have are either shipped on a ship through the, you know, your traditional cargo and containers or on rail. And again, that's diesel or on a truck, an 18 wheeler. Again, that's diesel. So this is, talk to me, if you don't mind, Brendan, about these metals right here that I've sort of isolated. Yeah, let's, you know, I'll just kind of, you, you said diesel prices have gone up 40%, right? And you saw that obviously uh, renewables and, you know, the energy that uh, these metals are going to be required to produce, you know, it's still a pretty low number in terms of global consumption. Um, and lithium prices went up, you know, 10, 20 X over the last couple of years. Now they come back, you know, down quite a bit. Um, but I think that that kind of highlights just how uh, sensitive these supply, um, you know, pipelines are relative to oil and gas and such that have been around and dominating, you know, the global theater for uh, the last hundred years. Um, I think it's going to be very interesting. You look at, you know, copper, another great example. Um, that's a metal that we've already been scouring the planet for, you know, for the last hundred years. Uh, we've basically mined out all the best deposits on earth. Um, you know, we're not making any new discoveries of, of note and significance. And so, you know, how are we going to ramp up, you know, copper production, you know, and, and multiply our current levels um, is, is kind of crazy to me. I, I don't know how we do that. Uh, you know, graphite is, is interesting. You know, that's one that uh, China produces about 60% of graphite right now globally. Um, you know, same as, you know, you look at uh, the nickel space, you know, you've got another geographically focused, um, you know, production with uh, Indonesia accounting for most of the nickel production globally. Um, you know, you look at cobalt, uh, with the DRC playing such a significant, you know, role in cobalt production globally, uh, you know, over 50%. Uh, China, again, tin, you know, that's something they dominate again. Um, you know, I'd say around 60% of that market. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it's funny. These are, 
you know, a lot of these were relatively small markets that were now forecasting to take over um, and essentially replace the oil and gas industry over the next 20 years, right? So, you know, you're talking about an industry that didn't really even exist, you know, within a within the mining industry, which itself was about, you know, I'd say one fifth of the oil and gas industry. Um, you know, so that growth profile is just crazy. Uh, I think it means you're going to see higher metal prices across the board for all these metals. Um, you know, not to say that oil and gas are not going to have their last kind of heyday. You know, I think those kind of things always stick around uh, longer than people expect, um, you know, partially because it's going to take a lot of time and a lot more metals uh, to get there where we don't need that stuff anymore. I agree with what you just said. Um, I won't spend much time on this part, but this just sort of shows current levels against mining effort in as updated as 2019. And to open more mines, we're looking at just, you know, some of these are well under 5%. So it comes, I guess the problem is minerals are the new oil now. And you tend, with the royalty model, you have the, the minerals. So that's good. This chart just shows that up here in this tiny little black box, this is all the metal that's mined. And it's right up here where you live. And right, yeah. right in here too. Um, so that, yeah, the crazy thing is you, you do have this really long development timeline in the mining space, you know, where it can take uh, on average, people say 15 years. Okay. Personally, I think that's optimistic. <laughs> you know, if you look at uh, traditionally how long it's taken some projects to go right from expiration all the way. I mean, you've, there are projects out there 25, 30 years uh, that have been still working through those processes. Um, but you can't overcome a big period of underinvestment in a space like that because, uh, you know, we had such little investment in across all these metals over the last, you know, 10, 15 years. And you can't overcome that, you know, by just throwing more money at it today. I think, um, you know, we've already kind of got a fundamental supply gap issue so that you will see higher prices. Um, but yeah, we need a lot more money to go into this space. Um, and definitely more and more towards the explorers and developers, uh, which is, um, you know, hasn't happened despite trillions of dollars being announced, you know, in the, the Green New Deal and uh, Europe's got its own version of that. Um, you know, so there's lots of money uh, globally going to it. But the fact is so little has gone to the, the explorers and developers, um, and those groups actually finding this metal and, and you know, going to be capable of bringing that out of the ground. So um, it's interesting. You know, I think. Uh, I, we see really a two decades opportunity here in this space. Um, and when you talk about that growth profile, I, I don't think there's a few times, you know, in life that you'll, you'll get that kind of an opportunity uh, to participate in, in that upside. And on our channel, most of the people have been fiercely, avidly, and almost to a point to where it's an obsession, stacking silver and gold. But it's been mostly to hedge against systemic risk and bad monetary policy and the erosion of the Federal Reserve note. They're doing it as a you know hedge. So when we're now beginning to educate people, including myself, we're never too old to learn anything. Um, the difference between, just tell us how the royalty model works for your company and how the shareholders profit from the lifetime like you're not even interested in the cost of production. Uh, yeah, so we're we're pretty good because we're hedged against inflationary pressures. Um, because we have no uh, really operating costs at these mines. You know, the miners in inflationary environment, all of their operating costs are going up significantly right now. Um, you know, we have no operating costs at the mine, uh, so uh, our costs are really our GNA, which is very very low. And you spread that GNA over across you know all the different royalties in your portfolio. Um, our GNA is, you know, less than around one and a half million a year. Uh, you know, we're going to be cash flow positive here uh, next year. And, and we see our cash flows ramping up significantly over the next five, six years, um, all at no cost to us. You know, we've had 500 million raised by operators all going into our assets since we've acquired them. And uh, we didn't have to put up dollar for that. You know, so um, that's, that's definitely one of the, the nice things. Um, we're also hedged against, you know, capital cost inflation because we don't have to buy the equipment, um, you know, to build the plants out, et cetera. So you see definitely a lot of uh, inflationary pressure there. Um, and ultimately, you know, the metals that we're chasing, I would argue are now more precious right. than your traditional precious metals. 
Um, and so, you know, the, those prices go up as well in an inflationary environment. We get exposure to that. Um, you know, our, our upside is directly proportional, um, you know, to to those metal prices. So uh, I think there's actually more upside, you know, in terms of the metal prices we're targeting, um, I would argue, than, than say gold, uh, which I, I did have an expensive, you know, career in and, and spent some time with before uh, transition to clean energy metals. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think there's a bigger opportunity in the space. I think, you know, what you're talking about is, um, you know, very unique exposure and rights. Like ultimately our royalties are tied against the projects, um, you know, cause we're dealing in good jurisdictions. And so those are really tied right against the metal in the ground. Um, you know, management team could even mess up. They lose that asset. Our royalty is going to still stay there. And when they, uh, start producing, they pull that metal out of the ground, they still have to pay us. So, um, I think there's a lot of, you know, security kind of things that you have um, definitely from the royalty space that help. Uh, but I also see this clean energy metal space is, you know, definitely more um, opportunity, I would say, over the next kind of, you know, 10, 20 years. Yeah. And I think people need to understand that, like it or not, um, we may say that it's an ambitious plan, the, the transition to net zero by 2050, but it's in milestones. So, you know, we're looking at the next milestone at 2030, 2040, 2050. And Europe is all in. Um, U.S. is all in as far as it doesn't look like uh, since the last election that we, you know, the Keystone Oak uh, pipeline was shut down. I don't think there's been uh, any permits allowed for drilling for oil on federal lands, uh, including offshore and in Alaska. So we I'm not saying that, I agree with all those you know, policies. Either. No, I'm, I'm just sure saying like it. That's why I say like it or not. Yeah, well, like I, I also just think um, I wouldn't call myself, you know, a climate alarmist in any shape or form. But you know, I you see what happened globally this year with the fires, um, you know, and has really been the last couple of summers the more intense storms. Um, you know, we have new names for stuff like atmospheric rivers here in in Vancouver. You know, things that didn't even really exist before. So I, I think it's hard to say that the the climate is changing. Um, you know, and I think there's going to be a bigger push for you know, this stuff as we move forward and as things kind of get worse. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's just great. I think the world does need to transition. I think this is really mandated by governments at the top. You know, they're really funding this, <laughs> you know, the governments are basically funding it. There's France, I think was doing a, you know, a hundred billion super elite wealthy tax. So they're just taxing them, you know, for a hundred billion to, to commit to this stuff. So yeah, I think this is really led by governments, um, you know, and, and, and really funded by governments, you know, up to this point. So um, I think that's a big driving force. Uh, you know, not that there's a lot of a lot of other money and investment going into this space. Um, but that's you know partially why we think that this kind of current technology and, and commercial application will be, you know, 15, 20 years at least, uh, because you've had hundreds of billions of dollars go into, you know, manufacturing plants, all that kind of stuff, you know, built around this supply chain. Um, and so it's it's gonna be interesting to see. Well, we yeah, I think yesterday we pinned an article, I'm sure it got um, pushed out there that, you know, the S&P 500 here in the States is sort of propped up by only seven companies that are called the Magnificent Seven. And then we looked closely at that Magnificent Seven and year ending 2022, most were down north of 20% and some as much as 65 to 70% in the case of Meta. Um, so we know they're not that mag. I was thinking, what if there? What if you had a church and there's 500 people, but only seven gave to the church, or a choir of 500 people, but only seven could sing, or let's just say there's 500 football players in the NFL, but only seven know how to play football? It wouldn't be that entertaining every Sunday to watch. So this isn't. There's no depth in the S and P 500. All the stuff's overvalued. It's going to rotate into commodities. And it looks like you've, I don't know how you did this, it's through your charm or whatever, but um, let's just take copper up there on the screen. For an 18-wheeler electric um, vehicle or a bus, they need 800 pounds of copper. You know, where? Yeah. Where, where are they going to get it? Come on, Brendan, let us know. Where Where are they? How do you do due diligence to know uh, the legitimacy of these mines in terms of them having the management and the ore grade and the, you know, the acumen. Well, that's, yeah. So let's, I mean, let's say uh, ore grades are going down. Um, you know, some of the mines that they're looking to mine now, 
uh, the latest one to get a permit actually in, in Arizona. Um, you know, they're, they're almost under the town, <laughs> you know, like underneath the town. Where'd you, uh, did you go to Bisbee for the copper? Or where were you? Uh, well, that's, well, that's Florence I'm, I'm talking about, but where did I go? Um, look, I mean, you know, traditionally like Chile, Chile has been a huge producer, but it's been tough the last couple of years. Um, you know, you look at the Biden's trying to, you know, propose his new, uh, royalty law, you know, Dan and Chile, they're talking about the same stuff. Um, it's kind of crazy. You're comparing those two, but, uh, you know, so it's been tough. I, I'd say for copper, we've been looking at, you know, the U S we've basically been trying to pick up like our Zonia copper project, a very simple copper oxide development project in Arizona, you know, CapEx is pretty modest around hundred million. Um, you know, we expect they'll produce about 50 million pounds a year, but, you know, trying to pick projects that, uh, you know, a little bit on the smaller side, something a bit more manageable. Um, but, you know, there was a couple of those in the United States um, that we that we like. Uh, same in Canada. Uh, although even though BC has such a great endowment of copper, again, another place that's really been, I would say, inhibited by policies, you know, around permitting, um, you know, kind of like is going on in, in Chile. So, yeah, copper's tough. Um, you know, people are going to the DRC looking for, you know, trying to get a slice of that action and the, the deposits there are much better, but you have so many issues from, uh, you know, the ESG perspective, uh, you know, and ultimately I think the world and, you know, really North America, Europe, Australia, you know, where a lot of these gigafactors are coming up are going to need, you know, to have some kind of domestic supply. Um, and so those are really the the territories that we're looking to, to get, you know, uh, projects and royalties over those projects. So it's, Electric royalties, um, I'll put the ticker in the uh, description field. And how would people, how would just giving tips, I guess we have to say not financial advice, but in terms of best practices, what would be a suggestion for someone to do more research on your company? Your, obviously, Well, I think the, the classic one, they always want to go into something where management's invested. <laughs> and I'm, I'm probably one of the more invested CEOs. I'm probably 95% invested. You know, personally, in, in this company, my family is, is very large shareholders, um, you know, around 15 percent. Um, you know, so that's always a big one uh, because I'm so invested. I'm so careful that you know, to make sure we were diversified as we grow and stay diversified. Um, but really, we're, we're a long term buy and hold. You know, uh, we've got very minimal GNA. We'll be cash flow positive. And uh, we see all the upside really coming at no cost to us over the next kind of four or five years here. Um, like we're talking about a significant ramp up in cash flows, you know, exactly what those are. <laughs> I might get in trouble if I try and, you know, forecast here for you, but um, it's going to be exciting. I think there's also should always be an acquisition premium, you know, in our space. Um, you know, our space is probably the most consolidated space in mining. Uh, there's very few royalty companies that make it to maturity uh, because ultimately, eventually it's easier for a big guy to come along and say, hey, I'll buy you guys, um, you know, at a big premium and I'll take 22 royalties in the same amount of time it would take me to do one deal. So, uh, you do see a lot of that happening. Um, but right now where we're at, I mean, our valuation is just crazy. Uh, you know, we're, we're trading at, uh, you know, a fraction of uh, of our net asset value and, um, you know, a fraction. And typically junior world to companies trade around one times now. So there's a lot of room for upside from yeah. here. Um, and I would argue that there's not a lot of downside risk, um, you know, by owning us at this point. 